so sorry. <laughs> I'll just stand right here. That's me, isn't it? everybody here. I'd just like to welcome to uh, Pastor Jordy and his wife Michaela for uh, leading the service today. So a couple announcements uh, for today. Uh, today's service is being um, led by our guest speaker, Jordan Van Dyke. And um, next Sunday on the 25th, we will be having Brad Joy as our guest speaker. And the service is going to be followed by a potluck lunch, so we hope that everybody can join us for that and that's awesome. Also for next Sunday, it's our second campfire supper, which will be held at Sandra and Tony Mead. And if you notice in your um, bulletin, the address is wrong. It should be RR40 campfire, but get it as soon as you can. And it will start at 6 o'clock. And supper is provided by the Mead family. Um, last week, we had 30 people that um, were together for dinner at uh, Carol and Sam's. Awesome turnout. We just um, blessed for that. And we just hope that everybody can attend again next week. Um, the next announcement is that the board has made a decision to do some renovations at the Mead's. And... There's going to be a calendar up on the wall to show that our progress or God's provision for that. They will be doing, um, completing renovations in the basement, replacing the floors. Uh, on the main floor, they will be doing new flooring throughout the, the main floor. They will be painting both the walls and the ceiling, and they will be replacing the central kitchen. And... There will also be no vacation Bible school this summer. I just issued a short notice, and because of COVID, we just kind of said we're going to go with it. So we just have um, a great week, and we're going to start with a big one today, I guess. So if we could just bow our heads together. Lord, we just thank you for this awesome roof that you gave us, and for the rain that was much needed, and we just continue to ask for more rain, Lord. Uh, maybe to help put out some of the fires as well as to moisture our crops. Uh, we just thank you for everyone that was able to attend, and for those that are online watching, we just thank you for them as well. And Lord, we just ask that you be with Jordy today as they go through service, this sermon today for us. Now, we just want to ask for you to be with us this morning, just lay down your Holy Spirit to our heart and open our eyes and our ears to hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we'll start with open offering. We can have the ushers.
between our gifts and our talents and our abilities, you get to use these as your wills and powers for whatever work you need to do to benefit the community and our little area of work that we do. And so thank you for being with us this morning. And you should be seated, and we'll continue with our worship. People are committed to reading the Bible through. I try and do it in one year, and that always makes summertime, Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and these are such good songs that I picked. You're going to love them. They come from the Psalms. How majestic is your name? I sing the mighty power of God, and it talks about creation and glory and it all shines back on God. So would you stand as we sing together? Good Frida, up and down, up and down. And I'll try not to play too fast. I tend to do that. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God. Oh Lord, God Almighty. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty have next Michelle was it is it the message next okay then we're gonna do one more song <laughs> if you're tired of standing up you can sit down I trust that you're gonna sing really well sitting too but we have a song before the message and also a really good one 
it's our opportunity to invite the Lord here. I mean, we have already done that. We've asked him to be here this morning. But just speak to us. Through the music, through the preaching, through conversation with friends and fellow believers, we welcome the Lord. We want to hear his voice this morning. of your holy word take your truth plant it deep in us shape and fashion us in your likeness that the light of christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith speak O oh lord and fulfill Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let their truth prevail over unbelief. Speak, O oh Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace will stand on your promises, and by faith will walk as you walk with us. Speak, O oh Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Thank you so much. Please be seated. Oh, good morning. Am I on here or is that something going on? You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm just used to the echoing feedback from my own church, so. <laughs> Pardon me while I just clear some room. Alrighty. In lieu of a canned personal introduction, uh, lots of you don't really know me. Um, and I have no idea how to summarize myself in five minutes, so here's what we're going to do. We'll take the next five or so minutes here, and you guys just ask me anything you want to know about me. I reserve the right to say pass. <laughs> but shoot. I'm 29. Me <laughs> too. Am I looking for a permanent job? Yes and no. It's a long story that I don't have time this morning. Hmm. Yeah? How long About five or six years. Marlene. Where were you raised? Uh, in Cochrane, down by Calgary. Uh, we moved there when I was about 10 years old or so. And um, so we bounced around between Cochrane and Calgary for the years before that. But Cochrane is really where I was raised. No. <laughs> I just don't watch hockey at all, so. <laughs> if you're looking for me to pick size, sorry, out of luck. 
<laughs> That's okay. Anyone else? All dried up? <laughs> Only been two minutes. Come on. I've got three more minutes here. What's your favorite food? My favorite food. Ooh, pork ribs. <laughs> Do I know anyone in the church? Yeah, I probably know six or seven of you, something like that. A few more. Um, I was formally trained at Ambrose University down in Calgary. It's an alliance Bible college and seminary. Um, I also took a lot of online continuing education stuff, so it's, it's kind of a mishmash of um, theological backgrounds. <laughs> My family, well, my lovely wife, Michaela, there. Um, married her five years ago this summer. And uh, my two boys there, Theo's the, the older one, and then Justice is our youngest. Uh, Theo is short for Theophilus, not for Theodore. <laughs> um, and Justice he is uh, the other name of Matthias, and he's also found, I think, at the end of the book of Romans. Um, love them to pieces. Um, we mostly spend a lot of our time at home we, we did a little bit of traveling before COVID, but mostly to see uh, extended family. Um, yeah. Before the foundation of the world. <laughs> but more practically, um, it was probably when I was about 19 or 20 that I really started to move in this direction. About 11 or 12 years, I would say it was 17 or 18 um, that I actually became a Christian. Hopes for the future. Hopes for the future. Um, ooh. That God would use me however he would please until the day that I die. <laughs> All right, three more questions and then we'll carry on. Edmonton. <laughs> so since it's come up twice, I'll give the 30-second blurb. Um, for a long time, God has put global missions as well, my primary passion in ministry, but not necessarily to be a missionary. Uh, I want to be part of a church that is very, very active in sending missionaries and supporting uh, global missions in general. So we're going to be moving towards Edmonton to be part of a church plant of a church that is very focused on being a sending church. So there's the 30-second version. <laughs> no, it does not. Hi. <laughs> Two more questions. I have one brother, yes, he's older. Um, he still lives in Calgary. One more. Uh, yes. <laughs> Blue, I guess. <laughs> All right, on to more important things. Turn with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter, um, we'll start in one. Now, if you know me at all, I'm a Bible guy. I want you to see what I'm seeing here. What I have to say doesn't matter at all. You shouldn't give a rip what I have to say, but you should care mightily what God has to say. So if I can't show you what I'm seeing in the Word, then I'm not doing my job. So I really want you, if at all possible, to have a Bible in front of you, whether it's on a you know, paper Bible or a tablet or a phone, I don't care. What matters are the words. I use the English standard, although it doesn't really matter all that much. And I'm a bit of an odd duck in that Revelation is actually my favorite book of the Bible. But it's not my favorite for the reasons that you might think. A lot of people like to get all wound up in the various specific prophecies, and you know, I don't really care about all that. Um, Jesus says he's coming soon. 
good enough. Um, but what I do love about the book of Revelation is what it does in my heart as I read through it. And number one, you cannot read the book of Revelation without the inescapable conclusion that God is holy. If you read through the book and you do not see that, you probably have not read it right. <laughs> and number two, um, every time I read through the book of Revelation, I come away with a renewed urgency that Jesus is coming soon, and we should do something about that. There are people out there who have never heard the name of Jesus. There's people out there who will not get to hear the name of Jesus in their lifetime. And there's people out there who are living in such a way that denies the reality of Jesus. And we really should do something about that. Um, and third, uh, it's kind of similar, but when I read the, through the book of Revelation, I'm reminded again of just how brief this life is in compared, comparison to the coming eternity. So why would I spend all of my effort making life comfortable now, devoting all of my time, my energy, my resources to building a comfortable life now when none of that's going to matter when I'm standing face to face with Jesus before the great white throne of judgment. So I love the book because of those things and, you know, many others, but those are some of the main ones. But this morning I wanted to focus in on some of the letters to the churches. Uh, I'm not going to have time to go into great detail on all of them, I'm just going to kind of dip into a handful here and then draw a few general conclusions. And this is going to be a little bit different than how I normally preach, but, you know, God does weird stuff, so that's okay. Um, I'm going to start reading in verse 9 of chapter 1, but before I do that, I'm going to pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you for the beautiful gift of your word, that you have not left us to navigate this life without a, a guide, and that by your Holy Spirit you help us to understand these things that you have left us. Hmm. Help us to treasure your word, to seek your face through it, to know you more intimately and deeper, and to walk in light of the realities that we read in these pages and not get caught up in the um, temporalities and the vanities and the trivialities that so often steal our attention and our joys here on earth. I pray that you would sink upon all of our hearts the weight of eternity here this morning. Let us see with right eyes. Let us hear with open ears your words to the churches. And help us to lay aside our own inner lawyers that would seek to defend us, to throw up a shield against any um, sterner words that you might have for us, and help us to overcome any brokenness that would keep us from hearing the good and the praise and the commendations that you have. Tear down the walls and the roadblocks that keep us from receiving your love this morning, Lord Jesus. And as I speak, I pray that the only words that would come from my mouth would be the words of truth from your word. Let nothing else be remembered here this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So these letters that we read, and as well as the whole book of Revelation, they went to these seven churches that were in Asia. So when you read this book, and this is just a general interpretation tip, when you read this book, you cannot read it under the lens of the 21st century. It had to have made sense to those original readers as well. So when you read it, you have to think, okay, well, what, this, what would this have meant to these original hearers? And then a lot more will start to make sense. So that's what I wanted to draw out of there, is this is a book written to seven literal churches. Whatever allegorical interpretations there are, there might be good things in there. I'm, I'm not going to go there this morning. 
Let's carry on, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So here we have Jesus, not as we are used to seeing him. And... If you try and interpret everything here literally, you're going to get a very bizarre picture of what Jesus looks like. So there is a mixture of literal and reality going on, all or literal and allegorical going on all over the place in the book of Revelation. And I don't want to get caught up in all of the symbolism here. You can find good books that will help you put, uh, you know, a one-to-one on what all of these things mean. Um, You know, super easy one, just to show you what I mean. It talks about how a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. Well, where else do we hear about a sharp two-edged sword? It's the word of God, right? Hebrews chapter 4. So he speaks the word of God with the authority of God. That's a good interpretation. I don't think swords literally come out of Jesus' mouth all the time. That'd just be weird. The other thing, um, here's John beholding an image of the glorified Jesus, and he rightly falls on his face in reverence and glory. And Jesus does something astonishing, and he touches him and raises him up and says, don't be afraid. In Christ Jesus, we can approach the holiness of God, not by any merit of our own, but by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So this does not mean we are flippant in his presence. This does not mean we are irreverent. But we do not have to be afraid in his presence. Which brings me to the church in Ephesus. Chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write these words. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. So here's the beginning of the church in Ephesus. It sounds like an amazing church. And this church has quite the pedigree, if you're familiar with your Bible here. This is the church in Ephesus. They had Paul living with them for three years. They had the Apostle John as their primary elder for many years. They had, according to church tradition, they had Mary, the mother of Jesus, living there for a number of years. They had Timothy as their primary pastor for a number of years. So you'd think if any church was going to get things right, it would be this one. (laughs) And there's lots of good things to say about this church, and Jesus commends them. He knows their works, the things that they're doing in service for him, and he's pleased with it. He knows their toil, you know, the the relentless pursuit of the things that are pleasing to him. It's, it's, It's a striving, it's an effort, it's a work. And he knows their patient endurance, you know, implying that there's a lot of persecution going on, and in Ephesus there was. Being a Christian in Ephesus was costly. So here you have a church that is zealous for good works, tirelessly pursuing the things that are pleasing to the Lord and bearing up patiently under intense persecution. And not only that, but they're testing the false apostles 
and found, finding them to be false. So they're very doctrinally sound. They have it right when it comes to all kinds of truth. Once again, that sounds like a great church, does it not? But verse 4, Jesus says, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You can have everything right. You can be doing all of the right things, believe everything that is right, be full of character and integrity and moral uprightness, and be failing if your first love is not the love of God. The love of God is the only thing of ultimate importance. Everything else flows from that. Your works will display what your loves are. Remember, Jesus says, remember from where you have fallen, repent and He doesn't say, love me like you used to. He says, do the works that you did at first. It is the works that we are doing that will display where our heart truly lies. And so I'm going to be bold for a moment and say, if your life does not revolve around cultivating the presence of Jesus, if your schedule is not built around time with the Lord, I would wonder, have you lost your first love? Now, I don't know any of you very well. I'm not speaking at any one of you here. Don't hear me say that. And when I was preparing for this message, I had to sit under that and really ponder, where does my love lie? It's always going to be our instinct to rise to our own defense and say, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm okay. Jesus loves me as I am. Okay. Does your life reflect that? Do you have in place the cultivated desire as well as the carried out action to be with Jesus first and foremost? What does Jesus himself say earlier in John 15? Everybody knows this passage. Whoever abides in me will bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Apart from me you can do nothing of eternal benefit. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Jesus motivates both with some scary threats. He says to the church, I will remove your lampstand if you do not repent. Meaning that church as a local body, will be eradicated. But he also holds out great promises. The one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So he's speaking both to the church corporately and to the individuals in the church. Punishment is for the church corporately, and there's also punishments for individuals, or shall I say disciplines, rather, but the reward is for the individuals. I'll come back to that a little bit more later. 
I'm going to skip over Smyrna for now, um, jump down to um, Thyatira. Sorry, no, Sardis. Chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come against you. Yet you have a, still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here in the West, in North America, we thrive on image and perception. You know, how do people see us? How do people perceive us? What do we look like? Jesus looks past all of these things. Here's this church in Sardis that has a great reputation, probably among the other churches. They have this reputation of being, you know, a thriving, lively church. But Jesus looks at them and says, you have this great reputation, but inwardly, you're dead. Appearances mean nothing. Only the opinion of Jesus matters. From one of the commentaries that I read in preparation here, the author writes, there's no words of commendation to the believers at Sardis, nor did the Lord point out any doctrinal problems that required correction. Neither is there any mention of opposition or persecution. The church probably would have been better off if there had been some suffering, for it had grown comfortable and content and was living on its past reputation. There was a reputation without reality, form without force. Like the city itself, the church at Sardis gloried in past splendor, but ignored present decay. In fact, even what they did have was about to die. Why? Because the believers had gone to sleep. Twice in its long history, the citadel at Sardis had been captured, each time because centuries had failed to do their jobs faithfully. It is when the church's leaders and members get accustomed to their blessings and complacent about their ministry that the enemy finds his way in. The impression is that the assembly in Sardis was not aggressive in its witness to the city. There was no persecution because there was no invasion of the enemy territory. No friction usually means there's no motion. The unsaved in Sardis saw the church as a respectable group of people who were neither dangerous nor desirable. They were a decent people with a dying witness and a decaying ministry. Our Lord's counsel to the church began with, be watchful, wake up. The centuries were asleep. The first step towards renewal in a dying church is honest awareness that something is wrong. When an organism is alive, there is growth, repair, reproduction, and power. And if these elements are lacking in a church, then that church is either dying or already dead. Now, once again, I don't know you guys. I don't know what the state of your church is. That's not my business. I'm here and I'm gone, right? I can say what I want and leave. So why, why am I saying this? Because you guys now, not having a primary pastor, are in a very unique position, and I think a blessed position, to now take an earnest evaluation of where you guys are as a church. Right, right at the beginning of this passage here, Jesus says that he's the one who holds the seven, the, the seven stars. And the traditional understanding of those stars are they are the pastors, they are the leaders of the church. So Jesus is saying, I'm responsible for those stars. And you notice he doesn't blame the stars, the pastors, for the condition of any of these churches. Pastors get way too much credit and way too much blame. 
were really not that important. Jesus is speaking to the churches, the people in the congregations. He has lots to say to pastors in other places. You know, we're under high scrutiny, don't get me wrong. But here and now, Jesus is addressing churches, you guys. So like I said, I don't know where you guys stand. But whatever issues there are in this church are not going to be resolved by getting another pastor. They're not. That's just not the way it works. Whatever past glories there were in this church, because of a pastor, let's say, it's useless and vain to look back and say, oh, you know, we were doing so well when we were under so-and-so's ministry. That's not the point. And also, any problems that the church is currently experiencing, let's be done with blaming past pastors. It's time to own up to whatever is going on. And once again, I know nothing about what's going on here. Please. <laughs> I'm not accusing you guys of anything. I'm just saying you have a wonderful opportunity to sit down as a church and evaluate where are we? What is going on? Are we alive? Is there some corporate sin that we have embraced that we need to repent of? I'll go over to that one here in a minute. You're in a very unique place, not clouded by one particular pastor's perception or leadership to push in one direction or another, to evaluate and to perhaps do some healing as a church. That's what I'm trying to say here. It's not ultimately the pastor's responsibility. Yes, he is there to feed you, to lead you, to guide you, to nurture you, but ultimately, you as a church are responsible for you as a church, not the pastor. All right, enough beating that horse. Jump up back to Thyatira, chapter 2, verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and your faith and your service and your patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. So here we have the opposite of what's going on in Ephesus. These people are excelling in love, both love of God and love for their neighbor. They're zealous in service and doing good works, and they're also patiently enduring under trial. But, Jesus says in verse 20, I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what they are calling the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. So there's a lot going on here. First of all, I don't think her name was literally Jezebel. I think everybody who got the letter would have known who, they were who Jesus was talking about. But there's probably allegorical stuff relating to Jezebel from the Old Testament. I'm not going to go there. It doesn't matter here this morning. Here is where tolerance goes wrong. Tolerance is a good thing. Especially in rural conservative churches, there is a tendency to cling very tightly to particular doct doctrinal aspects that are not ultimately important. I will live or die on the divinity of Jesus. I don't care if you are premillennial or amillennial or postmillennial. 
I don't care if you believe in the pre-tribulational rapture or the post-tribulational rapture. Stuff like that is not worth going up in arms over. These things matter, don't get me wrong. What you believe about them is important and it will affect your life. But there should be tolerance in the churches for those secondary issues that are not compromising the core of the gospel. Perhaps even to hit a little bit closer to home. Again, I don't know where you guys stand, so I can say what I want. It's great. Women as elders. A lot of people feel very strongly on both sides. Is that worth dividing a church over? No. That is not a gospel-centric issue. And I have my very strong convictions and passions about that. What's another fun one that we could pick on? Um, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll stop there. <laughs> my point is, there, there's things that we need to hold very tightly to, and that we can and should live or die on these things. The divinity of Christ, the supremacy of Christ, the, the authority of the Bible, the, the atoning work on the cross, you know, all of these things, we cannot let go of them, or we lose sight of the gospel. But all of these secondary issues we can and should probably be a little bit more tolerant of within a church. They're important and worthy to be discussed and find some agreement on. But even at the end of the day, if within a church they cannot be agreed upon, we give each other a hug and then go have a potluck. Because that's what we do out here, right? But where tolerance does go wrong is where we allow people to embrace things that do contradict those core essentials. So here, in Thyatira, uh, for those of you who are not quite as familiar with the Roman world, there was this practice where you could go to a pagan shrine and eat a feast that was sacrificed to an idol, as well as participate with the... Um, um, shall we say, seedier sides of life, and that was a form of worship for the Romans. And so in the name of tolerance, probably, here's this woman, codenamed Jezebel, who's saying, you know, we should try and be a little bit more like the world around us. You know, if we just embrace these things, they'll be, you know, we can do this whole evangelism in their corner and, you know, we, we share the love of Christ while we're doing this thing with them and then they'll eventually come there. No, that's not the way it works. We can and should have some cultural adaptation, but not to the point of embracing sinful things. <clears throat> Embrace of a grave sin comes with grave consequences. And once again, I don't know where any of you guys are at, so please don't hear me speaking at you. <clears throat> but here's Jesus saying that she's going to, he's going to strike this woman dead and all of her children dead, meaning her disciples, those who follow after her. That's a pretty strong judgment. Just a parallel that perhaps you're a little bit more familiar with. We're all, I think, mostly familiar with the passage where Paul talks about communion. And he says, you know, let none of you eat and drink in an unworthy manner. And this is why some of you are growing weak and ill, and some of you are even dying. Embracing a grave sin can come with literally deadly consequences. We are body, soul, and spirit, and decisions we make in any one of these realms affect the other. And so, of course, if you embrace a sin, you're going to start getting sick. Why wouldn't it? That's the way it works. But I digress. Jesus gave this woman time to repent. He says, I gave her time. He is not quick to judge. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So this leader in the church... She called herself a prophetess, and she was obviously accepted as a leader by many in the church because she had many followers, had embraced this sin. But not every person in the church agreed with her. 
some were calling her teachings the deep things of Satan. You know, probably making fun because she might have been calling these things the deep things of God. You know, and when you're a really mature Christian, you have lots of license and you can do those things, you know, right? Not everybody in the church was on board, and there were some who were vocal and speaking out against what was happening. I'm not going to go there, but in the previous church in Pergamum, a very similar thing was happening, but nobody was speaking out against it. And so Jesus condemned the whole church. But to these who stood up and spoke against the evil that was happening, note, they did not leave the church. They did not abandon the church to their fate. They stayed and they spoke up for the truth and they stood strong and said, no, this is not okay. And Jesus says to them, I do not lay on you any other burden. Can you imagine how phenomenal it would be to hear Jesus say that to you? I do not lay on you any other burden? Is that even possible? Well, obviously it is. In fact, two of these churches, Jesus had no words of condemnation for. The entire church was walking in such a way that Jesus was well pleased and satisfied and he had nothing bad to say about it. He says to them, I am coming soon, hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. You know, I read this book so many times and somehow I missed that. That it is actually possible to get to a place not just for a special elite few. You know, these are entire churches that are walking like this, where Jesus does not lay any other burden on you. Keep walking in the way that you're walking. How can this be when there's other passages that say, you know, First John, for example, anyone who says he is without sin is a liar and is making God out to be a liar. We will continue to have sin until the day we die. And I think Jesus cares more about where we're going than where we are. Going back to the church in Ephesus, have you lost your first love? Are you devoted to the pursuit of Jesus Christ at all costs? If that is your primary goal, if that is where you are driving, and you have dealt with all of the major sin issues, let's say, I think Jesus is satisfied. I think sometimes we are harsher critics of ourselves than Jesus is of us. And there's a word for that, that's called pride. I constantly berate myself because I'm not good enough. Well, the glory of the gospel is that, yeah, I'm not good enough. So what? <laughs> Jesus is. Amen? If Jesus is not condemning me, why do I condemn myself? But... Five of the seven churches, Jesus did rebuke. So from that, I can conclude that most churches probably have some corporate repentance to do. And we should not be too quick to assume we are in that two of seven rather than the five of seven. Until you have personally done the work Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my evil thoughts. If that is not the regular cry of your heart, if you are not giving Jesus room to speak in, to correct, to change, to redirect, to transform, don't assume he is pleased with you. And as a church, if you are not 
coming together as a church. Search us, O God. Know us, O God. Try our ways. Then don't assume you are on the right track. Just one more time. I don't know you guys. (laughs) But if you have done that work, if it is the regular practice of your life to give him room to speak in, to change, to transform, to bring out any sin that needs to be addressed, any buried secrets in your past, any ongoing habits that need to be addressed, then it is possible to be in the place where Jesus is well satisfied with who you are and where you're going. And that is a beautiful thing. I'll close off with this. 3 verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. The scariest thing that could happen to you is when God stops disciplining you. Do you ever think about that? Because then you're back in Romans 1 where God is giving you up to the evil desires of your heart. God disciplines us. He corrects us because he loves us. Not because he wants to punish us. Not because he wants to hurt us. But because he wants to give us joy. He wants to give us peace. He wants, us to, bl- he wants to bless us in ways that we could not possibly imagine even if that means a lifetime of suffering here and now. So do we give him that room to speak in out of his love to give us the opportunity and the blessing to repent? He's never harsh towards us. He gave himself up for us. His rebuke never comes from anger. It always comes from love. And it is because of that love that we can have confidence in his rebuke, in his disciplining, in his guidance, and know that it is for our good, always and forever, and our everlasting good, not just our temporal good. So I end where I begin. What is your first love? What is your life revolving around? Is it the pursuit of Jesus? If not, might I suggest taking some time, being with him, and giving him that room to speak in and change. Let's pray. Father, we're, we're all so prone to only want to hear the good things from you. We don't like being rebuked. We don't like being chastened. But we know that you do it because you love us, not because you're angry with us. And if there is a belief in any one of our hearts that you do it because you're angry with us, I pray that you would bring that out and destroy it. Because that's from the enemy. Help us to see you as our loving Heavenly Father who wants nothing but the best for us and is not content to leave us stuck where we are. And I pray for this church, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, I pray that they might be able to come together in unity and seek you. That they may discern if there's some corporate issues that need to be dealt with before the next pastor comes in. That they would be open and receptive to any word that you might have to speak for them. And I pray both for them as a corporate church and as individuals that one day, if they are not there already, they might hear you say, I do not lay on you any other burden. That they would not let the condemnation from the enemy be confused 
with your correction. But that the dominant tone they would hear is, well done, good and faithful servant. I pray that you would cultivate a longing in each and every one of our hearts to make love of you the first and foremost priority of our life in everything, and that all of our actions, all of our desires would flow from that. Come, Holy Spirit, do your work. Glorify the name of Christ in our lives and in our churches. Amen. Thank you, Jordy, for that word from God. The very first words of this is the splendor of the king clothed in majesty. I cannot imagine seeing Jesus face to face. I think we'll all be on our faces when we see him. Would you stand as we sing and, and worship one more time? seated, we'll uh, have our prayer time now.
Thank you, Chris. Father, we just thank you that you could be with us this time for service and that these folks really clearly see where it is for them. Thank you, Father, that we can come to you with our burdens and our pains and sufferings and know that you are hearing us. Father, we just thank you that we can trust in you and all that you do. You are the Holy One. You are our teacher. You're the one and only Abba. We just thank you for that, Father, and we just ask that you be with us this week and that show us where our hearts truly are and help us to see what it is that you have spoken to us today. And it's that we need to repent. We know that you will be justified in telling us what our sins are that are standing in our way to truly be with you and follow in your steps, Lord. So we just thank you for this, and we ask that you be with each and every one of us this week and to show us the way that we need to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. prayers that you would like to um, share with us, Sandra will write them down for you, and then I will pray for you.